Habakkuk's name means to wrestle or embrace, and he surely battled with crucial concerns regarding the world and God's plan. Habakkuk brought his questions to the Lord. Habakkuk's prophecy is unique among the prophetic literature. To begin with, most prophecies have God speaking to the people through the prophet, but in Habakkuk, the prophet speaks directly to God, the people not being involved at all in the conversation. There are elements of this in other prophecies, notably Jonah and Jeremiah, but no other prophetic book starts in this striking way. Secondly, in chapter 2, the prophet is instructed to write his message in large letters on a wall. Then thirdly, chapter 3 is a prophecy set to music, which was fairly rare. It was the earlier leaders such as Moses, Deborah, Samuel, Saul, Elisha, and David who had found music to be an inspiration for the prophetic word, although later Ezekiel too made use of music. In this book, we discover that Habakkuk says, sees, and sings, and we learn how to deal with life's big questions. Number 1. Habakkuk's Turmoil – What He Says We're listening to a conversation between the prophet and the Lord. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Habakkuk started with a bold question. Habakkuk 1, 1 through 2 The prophet questions God's judgments. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, the prophet's question, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear, even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save? Even though I scream to you violence, you will not save. Habakkuk was grappling with the twofold mystery of God's divine providence. He was perplexed by God's seeming inactivity. People were sinning, and God appeared to be doing nothing to stop it. Habakkuk 1, 3 through 4. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Then he described Judah's transgressions and lamented the fact that wicked people seemed to have the upper hand. Justice was a hoax. God answered Habakkuk's question by saying, Habakkuk 1.5 The Lord's reply, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. Keep a watchful eye on the nations. Habakkuk 1.6-11 For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards, and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earth in mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes, and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing this power to his God. Then God explained how he would punish his people for their transgressions by sending the horrible Chaldeans, Babylonians. Habakkuk 1, 12-17 The prophet's second question, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously, and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook, they catch them in their net, and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to their net, and burn incense to their dragnet, because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net, and continue to slay nations without pity? God's response did not appease Habakkuk. Rather, it seemed to create a larger concern about God's ability, as well as his apparent inconsistency. Lord, I don't understand this inactivity either, Habakkuk said. But now you tell me you're going to punish your own people with a people far worse than they are? 
What exactly is going on here? We frequently have questions like these because God's acts appear to contradict what we know about His character. When confronted with life's troubles, the first step should be to address them directly to God. Your openness poses no threat to Him. Even our Lord on the cross asked why. Matthew 27, 46 And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Number 2. Habakkuk's Tower What He Sees Habakkuk 2.1 The just shall live by faith, and I will stand my watch, and set myself on the rampart, and watch to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer when I am corrected. Habakkuk then built a watchtower so he could stand on the rampart and watch. In ancient days, watchtowers were built in the fields to assist and protect the produce. Habakkuk was expressing his desire to get a higher perspective. He would wait to hear what God had to say. Habakkuk 2.2 the just live by faith. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. God instructed Habakkuk to write his word in huge letters so that everyone could read it. In ancient days, public messages were written on clay tablets and posted in the marketplace. God would respond to Habakkuk's question and everyone would be able to read them. The first statement made by God is that time is important. Habakkuk 2.3 for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. He may appear to be slow in his acting, but bear with him because his timing is perfect. Because God is in control, timing is essential. We reside in the shadow of two massive peaks. The first is the birth mountain, and the final is the death mountain. We exist in the valley of time between these two points. God is in complete control of his actions. We only await his arrival. Habakkuk 2, 9 through 19. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples, and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire, and the nations weary themselves in vain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink, and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you, and utter shame will be on your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you, and the plunder of beasts which made them afraid, because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city, and all who dwell in it. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it, the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it, to make mute idols? Woe to him who says to wood, Awake! To silent stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. Continuing through the chapter, we see four woe passages in which God highlights sins common to that culture and ours. Covetousness, violence, seduction, and idolatry. God was stating that He would deal with those issues in His perfect timing. Then God responded, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. That is a prophecy of the second coming of Christ. I'm coming, God said, and I'll solve all of these problems. We must learn to wait on the Lord. So, how should we spend our time while we wait? By faith we live. This text focuses on two types of people in the world. The first type has faith in themselves. They are saved based on who they are and what they do. Habakkuk 2.4 Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. It's a matter of trust. God was saying to Habakkuk and to us. The New Testament uses this verse three times. Romans 1.17 For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, 
the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11 But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10.38 Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Habakkuk 2.20 But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. That is the third and most crucial answer to life's questions. Despite the fact that the world's thrones and temples fall, God remains in power. Nothing on this planet, no power, nation, or army can dethrone God from his throne. God is seated on his throne. Just keep believing in him. Number 3. Habakkuk's Triumph What He Sings We find a changed man here. Habakkuk has gone from wailing to singing, from gloom to glory, and from question marks to exclamation points. He started this writing in the valley and finished it on top of a mountain. What has changed? Neither God nor Habakkuk's circumstances were to blame. Instead, Habakkuk had learned to trust in the Lord and was preparing to sing. Notice the music terms all through the chapter. Habakkuk 3.1 The Prophet's Prayer A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigianoth. On Shigianoth, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. That's a musical expression and as stated in the chapter's final sentence. Habakkuk 3.19 The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and He will make me walk on high hills. To the chief musician, with my stringed instruments, that is, it should be used for congregational music, accompanied by an orchestra. Habakkuk 3, 3-13 God came from Temin, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah, His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, and his rays flashing from his hand, and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth, he looked and startled the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered, the perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction, the curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? That you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation. Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. Salah. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went, at the shining of your glittering spear. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked, by laying bare from foundation to neck. Selah Selah appears three times in this chapter. A pause is a musical term as well. Some interpret it as, think about that. This is a song of prayer. Habakkuk was singing a plea to the Lord for revival. That is the ultimate cure to everything. Revival. God is the one who fixes life's difficulties. God is the one who solves our society's problems. God knows the solutions that the government does not. The answer is not found in social services, but in God. God is capable of sending revival. The next phrase refers to God coming down. The sentences that follow retrace the steps of the children of Israel on their trip through the wilderness. The emphasis is on God coming down and being there all along the journey. If God could do it in the past, He can certainly do it now. God has not changed or diminished in strength. We should be asking God to come down and bring revival to America. Habakkuk 3, 17-18 A hymn of faith. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, Though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. This is a praise song as well. Consider how verses 17 and 18 are linked. Verse 17 begins with though, whereas verse 18 begins with yet. Regardless of the circumstances, Habakkuk was saying yet. Regardless of what happens, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, 
and the God of my salvation. That is the fourth response to the unresolved problems of life. Keep joyful in the Lord in all circumstances. Habakkuk then concluded by saying that God was his strength. Habakkuk didn't have all the answers, but he put his faith in his powerful God, who did. God appointed Habakkuk, a contemporary of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, to lead in tumultuous times. His name means to embrace, and he earned it by wrestling with God at the beginning of his book and attaining intimate closeness with God by the end. Leadership with no easy answers could have been the title of Habakkuk's book. This prophet pondered why God permitted the people of Judah to continue in their immoral and evil ways. He cried out to God, but had no response at first. God seems far too tolerant for Habakkuk's tastes. Finally, God revealed to him his plan to correct the problem by bringing up Babylon to plunder and capture Judah in war. Habakkuk was now in a new situation. Would God really employ a nation even more evil than Judah to correct Judah? This seemed preposterous to him, so he presented God with an integrity check. Do you really know what you are doing here? When God answered his question, he learned to trust and ended the book with a beautiful psalm of faith. Habakkuk teaches us to be praying leaders. The entire book is a dialogue between God and him, and it is the only book in the Bible that is put out in this manner. As a prophet, Habakkuk had to feed the people and guide the people. But first, he had to intercede for the people. Far too often, those of us in positions of leadership are doers who lose sight of this critical duty. In the New Testament, Peter stated that he would devote himself to two things, the Word of God and prayer. This is the first task of a spiritual leader. Habakkuk also tells us that it is permissible to challenge God. We should have such a close relationship with God that we can freely communicate our questions, worries, or bewilderment about God's methods. When we don't know what to do, we should turn to God for guidance. Habakkuk posed precise and specific queries. Leaders must be confident enough to confess they don't know everything and seek guidance from God. Finally, the most important leadership value we can learn from Habakkuk is trust. He knew he wasn't in control, any more than we are today. He waited for God. When God finally spoke, Habakkuk had to trust him because he didn't understand. In essence, his final psalm says, Although I don't understand what's going on, and nothing is going the way I want it to, I'll still rejoice and trust God's wisdom. Habakkuk must learn to follow God as the leader. In the beginning, the Lord remains silent and teaches his leader to wait. He eventually replies to Habakkuk's criticism in an unexpected way and teaches his leader to trust. He later demonstrates his supreme sovereignty over all things and encourages his leader to rejoice regardless of the circumstances. The way God treats Habakkuk elevates him to a whole new level of leadership. May God do the same for each of us.